Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back to session number two of our Student Ethics Symposium. Uh, my name is Brian Birch. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Ethics. Uh, and uh, we are hosting uh, a series of sessions today featuring uh, the best uh, undergraduate research from students here uh, at UVU. Uh, the two presentations that you'll hear in this session are from students who submitted through our application process and uh, whose work was accepted. And we're very proud uh, to feature them here. Uh, just on a couple of uh, administrative points, uh, the, uh, the event runs until three o'clock today. Uh, we're live streaming each of the sessions. And if you're tuning in via live stream, uh, we have a, a button for each session that allows you to jump into the stream. Uh, we're also capturing this session so that you can go back and watch the recorded uh, version just a few minutes after the session is over. And uh, look forward to interacting with you if you have any questions or input uh, on that front. So our first presenter today is, is a dear friend and colleague, former colleague of mine, Gabriel Toscano. Uh, Gabe is a former, uh, is a graduate, recent graduate of UVU. Uh, and uh, he also served as the communication director uh, in the Center for the Study of Ethics and uh, helped us develop our programming so that we can uh, bring you these events uh, electronically. So much of what you're seeing today is, is due to the good work of Gabe. But in addition to his uh, interest uh, in programming and technology, uh, he is very interested uh, in issues related to applied ethics and technology policy and uh, what he calls socio-technical systems. Uh, so you may be hearing more about that uh, in the presentation. Uh, we're just very proud of Gabe and the work he's done both here uh, in his UVU uh, work and also uh, uh, in his postgraduate pursuit. So uh, his presentation today is entitled, Technology is Never Neutral, Ethical Risks in Generative AI Deployment. So without further ado, we'll turn the time over to you, Gabe. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for coming. Um, I guess Brian said, my name is Gabriel. I have a background in philosophy, religious studies, and software development. And I am interested in um, talking to you about some of the issues we're facing with AI and how it's being used today. Let me just pull up my screen here one second. Um, so I want to talk about something that's been on everyone's minds lately, which is generative AI. These are systems like ChatGPT, uh, like Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, that demonstrate uncanny abilities to generate images, text, audio, and video with increasing accuracy and veracity. So they make things that look and sound very, very real. Uh, the discussion I'd like to bring us into is not about the dangers of AI taking over the world, but rather about how technological development is concentrating power in the hands of a few, reproducing systems of oppression, and damaging both the information and natural ecosystems. Again, I want to emphasize that this is not about a future where humans are subjected to the will of super intelligent machines, but about risks and harms resulting from AI technology in its current use. But first, some context. Um, I want to place this discussion within a broader context of historical progress and technological innovation. Um, according to Dr. Paris, a scholar of technology and socioeconomic development at the London School of Economics, we have witnessed about five cycles of technological development in the last 250 years. Each of them brought us new technologies. Each of them brought new ways of moving things around, spreading information, but they all shared one key feature, and that is that they brought about a lot of political turmoil and uh, boom and bust cycles. Additionally, they also brought in needs for different and more kinds of resources, and those are human resources, natural resources. And they've also been unable to deal with key issues related to systemic inequity and environmental decay. And I hope that throughout my um, uh, presentation today that you see the undercurrent that I'm speaking about is related to this these features of technological progress. Uh, and that is that AI algorithmic and autonomous systems 
are benefiting the world's wealthiest populations and disproportionately impacting the most vulnerable. So like any good philosopher, I want to define my terms. So first I want to talk about what AI is. Artificial intelligence refers to any technique that enables machines to mimic human behavior. And this is a very ambiguous term. And I would argue uh, very difficult to pin down exactly. We used to consider all sorts of things as AI, um, including things like calculators, which we no longer consider AI. But that is the definition we're working with here. Next, we have machine learning, which is a subset of AI and is a technique that uses statistical methods to train and teach machines how to do things by finding patterns from examples that it's been shown. And then within that, we have also deep learning, which is a subset of machine learning that uses neural networks to find patterns in complex and multidimensional ways. And this is seen as the top of the line bleeding edge technology at the time. And it is the technology that powers generative AI. And generative AI is a type of AI system that uses deep learning neural networks to produce synthetic digital media, such as text, audio, video, and still images. And at their core, machine learning systems are pattern finding machines. They're given lots of examples, they find patterns in those examples, and then can generate new data by calculating the best ways to arrange those patterns to meet their objective. All right. So examples of this, like I mentioned before, are creating text, voices, or audio, sometimes voices, um, video, and images. And as a software development, I want to introduce a technical issue related to the ethical issues I'm talking about. A lot of the problems that we're having with AI can be traced back to these deep neural network architectures. On the screen, you see a very simple example of a neural network that is built to recognize handwritten numbers, which is a very easy task for humans, but very difficult for machines. And you can see how there's this activation of neurons that fire off in specific patterns to detect these numbers. Um, these systems are described as black boxes because we can only see the inputs and the outputs without much knowledge of what happens in between. And this means that they're very difficult to interpret. Um, it is impossible, if not, you know, very difficult for the, even the people that built them to understand exactly what's happening inside them. Uh, these also, require a ton of energy to uh, be trained, produced, and deployed. And both of these problems, the problem of interpretability and the problem of energy use, get worse the larger the model and the data set. So the more layers this has, the more you know, neurons it uses, the more data it uses, the harder it is to understand its output and the more energy it consumes. Current trends in the industry and in the academy are pushing for larger and larger models to create systems with broader abilities across more domains. So now to the ethical issues. I want to emphasize these are not new issues. They have been issues that have come about with even recent technologies like the internet. The question here is more about the scale and depth and the ability to which these things are uh, a problem and they've been aided by technology. So first is misinformation. These models are already being used to automate misinformation at a very large scale. And because they make very high quality results, they can make things that sound and look very, very real. The second is bias. Because these systems are learning from patterns found in large amounts of data, uh, the generated content often demonstrates biases across many different types of identities and demographics. And third, but certainly not least, is environmental impact. These systems require a lot of resources and energy to be trained and deployed in the real world. So where are we with AI? If you haven't used AI, I'll give you a second to read the comic here. The point is that they are very good at doing uh, somewhat trivial tasks, and this is why I chose to talk about generative AI. There are lots of AI systems and machine learning systems that are being used in very specific scientific realms. 
that are solving problems in ways that we have never been able to before. But these generative AI systems are, again, use, being used in somewhat trivial and unhelpful ends. And uh, this example demonstrates what I call the epistemic AI death loop, where people are re reading, recycling, and having to interpret AI written content back and forth because we're using it to do away with some of the drudgery of having to write emails or memos in this case. But it's also introducing other kinds of drudgery. For example, in academic settings, in the school settings, teachers are having to more than ever worry about cheating at a very large scale. And because these systems are getting very good at simulating and giving the appearance of veracity, we can create um, synthetic media that sounds and looks real and authoritative. So the first question is misinformation and hallucinations. Hallucinations refers to um, the ability of AI systems to give confident responses that cannot be grounded in reality on its training data. Of course, this is the reason why we often want to use the systems. In the case of the example here, we're creating an image which doesn't exist in reality, right? And it's pretty fun to see these kind of things happen in AI. But they can also be used to less um, fun and creative um, ends, such as the image that I'm going to show next. And this is an image that was posted on Twitter and w spread widely online in the context of a very politically charged um, situation. You can see how this can easily lead to undesirable results. And if you look closely, it's not too hard to notice how uh, there's some things that don't look right, particularly with the sleeve there. However, if someone is adept in Photoshop or any kind of image um, editing techniques, it's pretty easy to get this to a place where it looks very, very real. I wanna give you another example of how misinformation um, is introduced um, through this technology um, with uh, ChatGPT. And this is the most recent version I asked it to tell me why lead is safe for human consumption. And I used uh, prompt manipulation to give me two kinds of response. The first is a response that has um, the safeguards that the developers implemented in it to try to prevent this misinformation. Uh, I'll give you a second to read over it. But the gist is that it tells me that it is not safe. Um, governments around the world have taken steps to limit human exposure because it's um, definitely not something that we should promote. However, as the next prompt response will show, it can also give a very unaligned response, and that is unaligned with human values, that leads to very dangerous information. And this is the kind of example that is really uh, worrisome because I can easily text this and spread it pretty widely pretty easily, um, more easily than we have been able to in the past. And just to emphasize how easy this is to manipulate, the next part of this, the next sentence, ChatGPT realizes that this is false and dangerous information, yet it still produced it for me, right? So even in the same paragraph, uh, it's easy for me to manipulate the results to uh, nefarious ends. And again, this is just one more, small example um, this has many implications for phishing and scamming and other kinds of internet misbehavior because we can create things that look uh, and sound very real uh, with very little effort. Okay, next we're gonna talk about bias. Here we have a somewhat trivial example of bias in machine learning. In this case, this is from a study uh, looking at a system that tried to identify and categorize um, and tell huskies apart from wolves. And you can see here that the training set was such that images that had wolves tended to have lots of snow on them. So the system that was being told to recognize and separate huskies from wolves ended up finding that the most reliable way to tell is if there was snow or not, right? So if it had snow, then it was a wolf. If it did not, then it was a husky. Now, this is a very trivial example, but this sort of pattern shows us how these models 
not only make incorrect predictions, but they can also make correct predictions in the wrong way. Basically, the model in question, again, is better identifying snow than it is at telling huskies apart from wolves. And then going back to the issue of black boxes, I want to emphasize that the positive relationship between model size and interpretability, that means in our current context with the current technology, the larger the model, the more they can do, the more difficult it is to interpret its results and vice versa, right? The smaller the model, the easier it is to interpret. So now I want to look at bias in terms of how culture is represented and how it's seen by the AI system. You can see the prompt given uh, to the leading image generation AI, which is Midjourney V5, which is a text to image generator. Um, I'm gonna give you the results of this prompt. You'll see on the left, a very photorealistic image, right? Most of us will not be able to tell this from an image unless you look really closely, right? And here is a historical image, right? An image of actually one type of uh, Polynesian warrior type. In this case, the Hakka is from a Maori population. And they represent a much more peculiar aesthetic and even the ex emotional expression, right? I realize that this example is imperfect, perhaps due to the lack of specificity in the prompt, but I couldn't rerun the test because Midjourney recently decided to take down its free trial version due to, quote, a combination of extraordinary demand and trial abuse, right? So people are already abusing the systems and the people building them and deploying them understand that that's the case. Just wanna give one more example of this sort of dynamic, right? In this case, we have a different subject, but very, very similar results, right? Even the composition of the image is similar. The um, emotional expression is very similar and this comes in contrast with historical images of, of Native American warriors in this case, right? So the point here is that AI systems present a homogenized picture of the world that replicates the patterns that it finds in large amounts of data. And that data is often created by Western and North American people in this case, definitely the case of Midjourney. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that point once again, that gener generated data looks like this because training data looks like this, right? And this is the classic kind of Western selfie look, right? And, and even image composure. And because we are training AI systems on images from all over the internet, and because the digital space is not equally representative of people at the margins in particular, these sets contain uneven distributions and overrepresent hegemonic viewpoints. Right, and you can see here another example of why this might be the case. This is from the Mozilla Foundation, um, where they're looking at who's using data sets and why. And you can see uh, the US and North America being way overrepresented. And this is just another example. So this is what the world would look like if you were to use AI, sorry, Twitter data to train your AI. Um, you can see how we could easily arrive at very geocentric and ethnocentric results because this is the data we're giving it. This is the picture of the world that we are giving it. Lastly, but certainly not least, is the environmental impact of these um, systems. Um, researchers are actively addressing this issue and are benchmarking systems energy use. Uh, neural network models use immense amounts of energy for training. And yet, this does not include the energy used for retraining, which is necessary to update the systems. Meaning, if you want to, um, if you want ChatGPT to tell you what's happening this week, it would require people, uh, OpenAI, to retrain their system and also the energy used to deploy these systems, right? To make them usable, there's a lot of energy use there. Uh, moreover, as I mentioned previously, trends in research and development are pushing for larger and larger methods. For example, in this, here you see on the screen that the transformer, uh, that their benchmarking has 213 million parameters. ChatGPT3 and JetPT4 have about 175 billion parameters. And OpenAI has not released energy use metrics for these newer systems. Here to emphasize the point, 
we can see here that the carbon footprint is growing the larger the model is. And again, ChatGPT has not been benchmarked because OpenAI has stopped releasing this information to the public since 2019, right? So we're about four years behind in knowing what's really going on in terms of um, its energy use. And this also underscores another growing problem that the sheer intensity of resources required to produce publication worthy results has made it increasingly challenging for people working in academia to continue contributing to research, right? It's just too expensive and too computationally heavy to, to do this work efficiently. And these dynamics are resulting from people's business and architectural choices, right? For a long time, Silicon Valley has promoted the rapid development of technologies. But the key question here is when you're moving fast and breaking things, what are you breaking? Um, I'd argue that we do not currently have legitimate procedures for making decisions about how we develop AI responsibly. Um, I think that a greater focus on the effects of social technical systems is pushing the industry to paint a different picture, whereas social responsibility, accountability, and transparency are a greater part of the equation. But I don't think we have good reason to think that we can rely on the industry getting this right on their own. Uh, moreover, I think that at this time, generative AIs are not providing the kind of value and technological benefits to offset its risks and harms, particularly for people that lack access to these technologies and suffer the consequences of widespread bias and climate change. And I just want to exemplify why this is happening and some of the issues related to the industry. This is a paper that became very famous. Um, and it was published in collaboration with Google AI. And the two authors on the right were actually the chief AI scientist at Google, sorry, the chief AI ethicist at Google. And they were both uh, threatened with termination if they published this paper, which is why, as you will see, Margaret Mitchell, Dr. Mitchell, decided to remove her name uh, in, a, in a pretty uh, unironic way here, um, demonstrating kind of the hostility that she saw in Google, but she felt she could stand behind the research and wanted to publish it anyway. Both Dr. Gebru and Mitchell have now left Google and started their own venture. So in conclusion, generative AI is primed to automate misinformation because it's so good at providing things that look and sound real, and it makes it really easy to do so. It encodes bias and hegemonic views because the data we train it on represents those views and is very, very resource intensive. And in conclusion, like technological revolutions in the past, the benefits and harms of AI are not equitably spread. And they're addressing the needs of a wealthy global minority and expanding harms for people subjective to these systems. And I am out of time. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Gabe. Terrific presentation. Uh, next up is uh, Chloe Tam. Chloe is a software engineering major here at UVU. Uh, she has a background in fine art and user experience. And she uh, has said that she's interested in making complex technologies more accessible and friendly to the public. Uh, her remarks uh, this morning are entitled The Ethics of Machine Learning. So without further ado, Chloe, take it away. Thank you, Brian, for the introduction. Uh, again, I hope everyone can hear me. And yes, my name is Chloe Tam, and I'm super excited to uh, be sharing with you about machine learning today. So I am very interested in um, making complex technology more accessible to everybody, because I don't know about everyone, but I was not a naturally gifted wizard in technologies, even though I'm studying software and all that cool thing. Um, but when new trends in technology comes around, we, um, me and a lot of my 
classmates and colleagues also need to um, kind of try to figure out what it is, how can we interact with it. And I really believe in um, having like a realistic context for, um, for technology so that we can have more productive uh, conversation about how we can better interact with it. So hopefully through this presentation, um, I can help you understand a little bit more about the fundamentals of what AI and machine learnings are. And we can kind of hopefully like take away a little bit of the mystery and fear or confusion around it. So we can like um, help us have like a more productive interactions with it. And so without further ado, let's get into it. And so these are the topics we're going to cover, a very general basic introduction about what machine learnings are, and then like what are some things that the people in charge of the, the AIs can do, and how can we better interact with AI so that we can um, kind of offset a little bit of the harmful aspect of it uh, in our personal lives. Um, so what, what is machine learning? This is a little bit of a review from the last presentation from Gabriel. So um, we know that AI is a very broad term that has been coined in around the 1950s, I believe. And it, it was describing a lot of things um, such as like computer being able to do calculations, they were able to play chess and board game. And at the time people thought, oh, machines are gonna take over the world and it's gonna, cause it's doing something that people can. And it's, it's kind of similar to what's going on today where, um, but personally I believe we're still a long way away from machine doing uh, what people can do, replacing humans is what I mean. Um, and yeah, so what makes the AI of today especially different from the past couple of decades is that we develop machine learning and, and optimize it so that we can make machines do magical things like chat GPT and image recognition, all that stuff. Um, but what what exactly is machine learning? It is um basically just a thing that labels things and separate different things by categories or other systems. Um, it is a thing that makes lots of small decisions um, on new information. So for example, it can determine if, oh, is this email a spam or not spam based on the phrases that is in the title or in the content. Uh, how much did I fit on this next bit? What's the migration pattern of blue whales for the, this next season based on the weather or whatever? Um, and so it sounds a lot like what we're already doing with technology today, right? Um, but the difference between machine learning and traditional programming is that in traditional programming, we programmer have to know, think really hard about the specific steps, the instruction that the machine needs to do to get the answer. And then we communicate that through code. But now with machine learning, we can give examples to the algorithm and then have it learn by itself how to do, how to come up with the answer. Um, so it's kind of, we can think of it like it's too natural way of human communicating with other humans, right? We can tell other people exactly what we want, like step-by-step -step instructions, or we can give them examples and have them learn. It is just another way that we can communicate with machines and have them to do what we want them to do. So here's some examples of how the algorithm work. And here are, here's some data on uh, playing with uh, X and Y axis. 
And how can we separate the blue from the red? Think about it. We can separate it through putting a line in between it, right? That looks good. So these data represents the training data that a machine learning model would have. And this line is what it learns. It's the, the recipe here that it came up with. So great, now we can test this recipe and see if it's, if it's working. So a new data comes along. And according to our model, we would guess that it is a red dot. So great, it's a red dot. Another point, another win for our model. And we trust it more and more, the more it gets right. But what if it's a blue dot? Then we adjust our model, our recipe, so that we can have a more accurate prediction of the future. And there are lots of many different ways of like dividing these two groups, right? So there's no one one way of like um, no two models are going to be the same, and they're going to come up with their own way of separating things, even though they can generally still do the task perfectly. So this is like some of the more confusing, like volatile aspects of machine learning and AIs is that it kind of has its own mystery to it, but um, we can see that it's, it's still just trying to separate things here. And the way that it separates, the shape that it's allowed to separate uh, things is the difference between different algorithms. For example, we can have a line, we can have decision trees and neural network is the most flexible one where you can just go around everything and have perfect scores on your training data. Um, but as we can see, the more flexibility we have leads us to more errors or like finding patterns in where patterns are not. So for example, let me explain a little bit of what I mean by that. If we have some new data that's more confusing looking, how can we separate them? Do we see some patterns here that we can, like there's kind of like the shape here, but actually this data is completely random and we should not, if we like try to predict it based on whatever shape this is drawing, it's not gonna be helpful to us. And if we have a neural network, it is what's gonna it is gonna give us some kind of pattern, some kind of recipe um, for us to work with and predict. And if we rely on that, disaster is gonna happen. So it is very important that we understand the data we're working with at the very beginning before we make AIs and so that we can kind of help mitigate some of these unintended patterns that's happening. And so, as we can see, these are, these patterns finding are not really based on any real meaning or things in scientific, or like proven truth that we can kind of kind of patterns that we can kind of stand by. It's it's more like a do whatever you want machine. Just make something that works, and then we can like try to you can do whatever we want. We we don't understand how you work, but just do do what you're told. Kind of thing going on. So, so that's why um, a good thing to keep in mind when we're using AIs and things that are built on machine learning is that don't take it too seriously when it came up with some kind of answer. Um, and I learned this a lot from Cassie, the Google chief decision scientist, which has a very amazing 
machine learning course, which I recommend everyone to take. Um, and yeah, so it is hard for, it's easy for her to say, but as the user and as some, as people that are being kind of experimented on by people with more power using the results of machine learning, we have to be the one to kind of remind people that we have to check the results of machine learning and AI, we can't just take it and use it. And let's talk a little bit, like reveal a little bit about the complexity of machine learning here. Um, for example, the, the examples that I was showing in the previous side, slides has only two parameters, right? X and Y, it could be, it's similar to how when you make a recipe of two ingredients that gives you like some numbers of combinations that you can work with to like create a dish, right? And if you add some more ingredients, it's gonna start looking more complicated, the possible possibilities of recipes, right? Um, and then when you add, layers upon layers, more and more parameters, ingredients into the mix, it's just gonna be like a jumble mesh of math and numbers that are really, really hard to understand or like interpret. Um, as we can see from, we mentioned a little bit about how many parameters like our current large machine learning models has like 100 millions or billions actually, a hundred billions of parameters. It's pretty much impossible to really break it open and interpret it in like a human way for a human to understand what's going on. And it's, but it's kind of the point of machine learning is to figure out ways, solutions to get an answer that the solution, the instructions is too complicated for humans to explicitly write out. So that's why we give it to the machine to figure it out. But we, what we do know is that it is finding patterns, what it's doing all along through like all these complicated maths are trying to find patterns within the data so it can predict on new information, right? So, whatever the strength of machine learning is finding patterns, but its weakness is also finding patterns where it shouldn't be. So this is also a kind of reveal. We can look at these four pictures. And if a model is trying to determine if it, some pictures are has a puppy or not a puppy, it would like learn its way, do whatever it can, maybe look at the eyes and nose. But there's something in common for all the puppy pictures here that doesn't necessarily have to do with it being a puppy. And yeah, you can probably see it's the toys here, right? If it picked up the toys and like have shortcuts because determining the faces of animals are really hard. So it'll just say, oh, I just see that if there's a toy, then it's a dog, it's a puppy. So this is a less serious example, right? Um, but as we mentioned before, if it's applied to a large scale on culture and like our entire history of internet, then it can become problems if we take shortcuts. Some examples, of these problems are that the portrayal of a lot of um, minority communities, less represented communities and uh, social movements, majority of the time on the internet, maybe it's not portrayed in a completely truthful way. For example, like news outlet would just take the most sensational events, the most violent and um, 
unbelievable things about what's going on and like generate content text for it and put it on internet and when ai pick that up it's gonna portray like events in that way and even if we're applying machine learning in medical setting and helping people get better diagnosis well where did it data came from is it mostly data on like privileged um ethnic group or classes or people with like a certain lifestyle is it not gonna it's gonna just help those people and push down and further harm the people that are not in like a well researched and documented group of people in terms of like in the medical space or are, is our language that we use today is the AI is gonna be up to date on the language that we're using as we are like a redefining how we describe ourselves, our narrative, AI is not going to be for, not going to be able to retrain itself as we like saw uh, from the previous example, because it costs a lot of energy and data to kind of have it like train and change its way of thinking and reasoning. So it's going to take a while for it to catch up to the current way that the society evolved and are we gonna hinder those progress progress and there are lots of many many examples that we can think of um and that we can't show them all here in this presentation section but i hope you would like kind of think about it and explore more of that on your own time and thought about how we can kind of offset still harmful things um yeah and these there's some ways that we can try to help remove those harmful things we can create the data document it, implement safeguards and the most important thing is that we have to be intentional about how we use it we understand its limit it's not truth seeking it's not saying the truth we can use it to inspire us and expand on our creativity but we also have to constantly challenge the validity of what it's saying it's a lot of work that we shouldn't have to be the public shouldn't be the only ones that are doing this but it's it's the way that it's how do i say this it's a useful way um a way that we can push back on the current system that is like putting this structure technology onto us and changing our lives. Hopefully we can use it to understand our current structure of power better and to challenge that. And I hope that this gives you a little bit more context into dealing with that. And I'm also running out of time and thank you so much. And that's my presentation. Thank you, Chloe. Appreciate that very much. So zooming back out, we have about uh, just uh, five or six minutes uh, for questions. Uh, one question came in that I think applies to both of you and it has to do with the idea of how much we can depend on information authorities given the complexities involved in data manipulation, image manipulation, you know, misinformation, disinformation, uh, uh, how are the uh, foundational structures of, of data gathering and, and reliability changing? Either of you can take that one. Here, I can start um, if that's okay. Um... So we already have legislation uh, that's addressing this stuff. Um, the U.S. has something called the uh, AI Bill of Rights that they're trying to develop into legislation that has, you know, grounding in in the broader criminal justice system to hold people accountable. But it's still, for now, at least in the U.S., and it's very early stages. Europe is much further along, 
And just to give you a sense, uh, Italy recently banned ChatGPT because it violated the uh, general data protection regulation, the GDPR. And if most of you at this point probably have some uh, familiarity with the little cookies setting, right? With warning, it comes up on websites saying, hey, we're tracking your stuff. The reason why that exists is because of the GDPR. So Europe is has more boots on the ground when it comes to the regulating uh, information and how it's presented online. And I think that um, we should have a concerted effort between industry and government and the broader public when addressing these issues. Thank you, Gabe. Chloe. Yeah, I also want to say that um, there are a lot of good can be done from just having being more transparent and having being more open about the carbon footprint and also what kind of data is being used. And through that, hopefully we can also have like a some kind of third party government, not government organization that can like at least symbolically have a standard there so that we can like all agree on something and like put out guidance on like what we think is the best and we can like all collaborate together to to like uh, make those changes happen. Good, thank you. Maybe one last question. It, it has to do with uh, th this question of the extent to which uh, machine learning uh, can actually outperform humans in certain time types of responses and adaptability, you know, and what the what the ethical implications are uh, uh, for us in terms of sharing labor uh, with or or producing uh, 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 machine learning. Uh, for certain types of tasks. So again, either one of you can take that on if you'd like. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll speak briefly. Uh, it is the case that it can, it can produce better results in humans, but when it fails, it fails pretty, pretty um, laughably, like I had in my presentation. For example, uh, you can trick even the best AI systems to play games like Go, which was one of the benchmarks, right, for systems be, being better than uh, machines. But a human can easily trick the machine into losing using a trick that any human that plays go even at an amateur level would not fall into so the question is in what context are we using these machines right are we using it where it's like life or death decisions or when someone's receiving medical care or getting access to a job or is it something more trivial like we were talking about you know generating images that are accurate to life that's the kind of question, that's the crux of the ethical question for me. Yeah, I agree that, like, for my presentation, I can see that, like, a lot of what AI put out is not all the time very reliable, right? So whatever, whenever there's a situation where there's very high stake, we, like, have to have safeguards that, like, go through probably human checking through them. Um, I believe AI can help a lot of people with a lot of different tasks. For example, as a programmer, it's like make my life like 10 times better <laughs> working. It's honestly like a great, great tool for us, um, but not so much for like other people like customer service people where it's like it's gonna completely replace their job. Um, but it's kind of inevitable, which is like a really, I don't like saying that word, but um, it's inevitable it's going to replace some jobs, but I hope that as we're like jumping onto the train as societies and we're on a train to automate more jobs, we can like, when there are high stakes, we, we need to put in safeguards here. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. A, a lot of interesting questions and ideas come out of, of your presentations. Uh, we could, we could spend uh, ample amounts of time, uh, yeah, engaging them. We just want to thank you both uh, for for uh, being part of this event here today. Uh, we look forward to uh, questions and comments from students uh, who either are watching the live stream or who are planning to tune in later on uh, in coming days and weeks. Uh, so again, on behalf of the Ethics Center, thank you, Gabe. Thank you, Chloe. Uh, 
appreciate your, your effort. And uh, we look forward to our next uh, session in about 10 minutes, which will be on censorship.